right, well, um, we'd like to welcome everybody to the class. Thanks. Uh, good to see you. Oh, I've already got a heckler. I love it. Love it. it always kind of makes it feel a little bit better. Um, this class is how to prioritize your marriage during the middle school in teen years. Uh, my name is Matt Kuchar. This is my wife, Holly. Hey. Yeah. Joel, Joel and Rini Seabalt. Yay. Yay. And so um, we're going to start just kind of, uh, we're going to share a little bit of our story and who we are, and uh, then we'll kind of go from there. So anyway, I've got notes for this because I don't know who I am, right? So <laughs> have to have that. Um, Holly and I have been married, that is going, it is recording, so cool. Um, Holly and I have been married for 26 years. Uh, we've got three beautiful children. Uh, they are Josh, who is 22 years old now, uh, Corinne, who just turned 21, and Jessica, who is 19 years old. So it's a new part of our lives. Uh, we have just gone through the middle school and high school years and are ne now newly empty nesters. So uh, all of our children are out of the house. Uh, we are here probably not because we did an excellent job of prioritizing our marriage during the middle school and teen years, but probably more because it was a time where we didn't prioritize our marriage and our marriage ended up suffering for it. So we get to share maybe a little bit of vulnerability about what had gone on, what we were doing, what led to that, and then um, eventually how God healed our marriage and, and kind of moved us moved us forward you know and I think um, you know to to get back to it when our kids were in middle school it was during the beginning of the downtime anybody great remember the great recession you know that we just kind of went through yeah it was it was pretty rough well I was in real estate and the thing that caused the great recession was real estate so financially it was a very difficult time uh, in our lives and I was having to work a lot of hours just to try to make ends meet and on top of that had financially made some mistakes and you know was living beyond our means to begin um, you know at that we were also on top of being in that industry during that time uh, my son was in travel hockey so and I was the coach I volunteered to coach if anybody has any idea what that's like that's three to four times a week you know, several hours every every time. Um, on top of that, we were co-leading the middle school ministry with uh, Mike and Meredith Holging. We were leading a Bible talk, and you know, we had a lot of things that were going on in our lives. If anybody asked me to do anything, I was kind of that yes. You know, I was the yes person, and so the girls were also involved in a lot of activities as well. Um, Jesse was in gymnastics. Corey. Actually, all three of them had voice lessons, were in choir, in um, plays at school. So as you can imagine, we had a lot going on. Um, so our normal kind of um, conversation, well, actually, I'm sorry, as, as well as all that, I was driving them all to school, picking them up after school, taking the activities. I was working part-time at Michael's in the morning, so I'd get off about noon, um, come home, and then I'd work for Matt doing some of his advertising before I ran and started getting kids. So we had a lot going on, to say the least. Um, so a sample of our communication during that time might have been me saying, hey Matt, how's it going today? Or how are you doing today? And I would be like, you know, uh, I've got two appointments, I got a buyer later on today, the seller's been a pain in my neck, no, it's not selling, and then, um, I've got Josh has hockey tonight, so I've got to go coach, and so I'll be picking him up and taking him to hockey. Uh, what do you got going? Well, after work, I take care of your your um, advertising. Then I'm going to run and get them at school. Then we've got voice lessons before we have to be at Jesse's gymnastics, and then we have midweek tonight. Got so. it. Sounds good. Now, are you going to cook dinner, or do you want me to pick something up? So that was our typical communication <laughs> during this time of our life. <laughs> you know, um, it wasn't always business, but much of our marriage centered around everything that we had going on. Um, I felt very stressed. I certainly felt busy. Um, 
And I, uh, ashamed, you know, I felt like, oh, I should be able to provide for my family. We shouldn't be in this financial type of a situation. So I just need to work harder, and God's just going to work everything out. That was kind of my mentality. I also feel like I used busyness as a wall. Um, it was easy for me to say, well, I'm so busy. I don't have time to talk about my feelings. I don't have time to talk about what's really going on. Um, let's just stay busy, and it'll just kind of work itself out. Um, and I, as most men, when they get stressed, uh, I would get angry, uh, shut down, or try to fix, you know, Holly with anything that she came to me and really wanted to talk about. And for me, during this time, because he was so stressed, he would snap. And I walked on eggshells all the time trying to keep him calm and keep the, the calmness of the house. Um, so I found myself becoming more withdrawn. And... You know, it. I pulled away. It, I can look back now and see that that was that was me. I can want to blame Matt for it, but I made those choices. I mean, look at the stuff that we just learned this morning or this afternoon in these classes and the things I could have done better, and I didn't. I pulled away. I withdrew, and our marriage finally started just tanking, and it took a very bad crisis in our marriage to really wake us up. Yeah. And so that's kind of who we are, uh, or what, where we were when we were in the middle school and high school years. All right. Yeah. Um, we, uh, I just wanted to say it's been great to get to know um, Matt and Holly. We, uh, we had a couple times where we Skyped when we uh, knew that we were going to be teaching or sharing this class together and uh, kind of got to know each other through pixelated, you know, <laughs> images <laughs> or, or unpixelated images, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, but we've really grown to love you guys and appreciate your uh, being here and working with us on this class. So, um, but, uh, and then even this morning we got to meet face to face and kind of go over it together, kind of try to organize it. So it's been really good. Um, uh, we are Joel and Rini Seabald, and uh, this is my... Um, uh, as someone said uh, earlier today, my um, blonde, vivacious wife. <laughs> um, You're colorblind. <laughs> okay. But um, we've been married for 20, uh, or, I'm sorry, 30, it, it, today's the 23rd. Okay. So <laughs> that's, why, that's why I stumbled there. We've been married for 33 years today. Oh. So um, we got married in Florida. Uh, in South Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, um, All right. 33 years ago, and it was a Saturday. Today's a Saturday, so um, so my my son could be able to figure out you know the math on how that all worked out. But um, he's a he's a, uh, a math major or is a uh, graduate of uh, uh, applied mathematics. So he all that stuff's easy to him. <clears throat> but uh, we have four kids that are that range from uh, 30 years old down to 25. Um, three of them live in Colorado Springs. We, we, we moved out uh, uh, from Philadelphia where all of our kids were raised. We lived there for 20 years. Moved out to Colorado Springs uh, about seven and a half years ago. Wow. And uh, I'll let Rini fill in some blanks that right. are important. So we moved out because Joel really moved for me to Philadelphia from Florida because um, my family lives in Philly, and uh, we moved to Jersey first and part of the New York church, and then we moved when the Philadelphia team was um, planted there. And so our kids were raised there, but Joel never really loved the East Coast too much. And then we always said we downsized when the kids were little, um, when they grew up, and then um, when our son was going to college, Joel, uh, about a year before, he said, how about we move to Colorado? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? And um, so he's like, you know, just think about it. You can move anywhere. I'm like, honey, I was just thinking of moving to another house. <laughs> 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 about moving, you know, to Colorado or anywhere. For he's like, you could move anywhere. I'm like, hello. So anyway, here we are because it was God's will, I'm sure. Amen. And um, and. Um, it is pretty neat because you know our kids are here, and um, all, one of our daughters, our third daughter, is still in Philadelphia, and um, so we um, just 
our oldest daughter has two little grandbabies, so we're like thrilled to be close to them too. And um, so we have um, just, you know, we we met as disciples, and um, we both were converted in the campus ministry. And um, I was at University of Florida, and Joel was in Montana. And um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of things that you think are going to just work out in your family. Like I was really pretty naive and just thought, you know, if you become a Christian, your whole family is going to just like, yeah. everything's like, I'm going to be the best parent around. <laughs> and, you know, your kids are all going to be perfect and everything's going to be perfect. And, you know, lo and behold, life happens. And, you know, you, I'm such a bad um my kids would always say I yell at them and I don't yell so I don't have a great yelling voice but I'll try really hard (laughs) Um, so anyway I think um, we you know learned a lot through the years with our children and I think because of our children now and the ages that they are they can tell us a lot of the things that we did good and the things that we didn't and um, you know our um, all of them um, and um, you know, we talked with the Kuchars too. All of our children became Christians. There, our daughter, um, our third daughter, Amanda, has fallen away, and um, she um, has just gone through a little hippie stage. And she um, was in college, and she, when she was in her senior year, she decided to stop college and also leave the church. So she's wonderful child we have a wonderful relationship with her and I think God just has a plan and um, so we can talk a little bit more about that too but the rest of our children the ones that are here actually are all in go to church with us too and um, so we are very grateful for that Amen. Matt's gonna just kind of pray for us as we continue the class Now let's bow our heads in prayer. Uh, Father, we come before you grateful for this weekend, th- thankful for those who put the effort into uh, bringing us here and uh, planning the, the lessons and just everything. Mm-hmm. Fill us full of faith, faith for our marriages, mm-hmm. uh, faith for one another, uh, for, with hope uh, that wherever our marriage is at, we can always hope uh, to get closer to you and to get closer to our spouse and fill our, fill our full weekend with love. Uh, just pray that you would rekindle that, would strengthen that, uh, and that would be the overriding um, theme that we would have, that you would guide this lesson, that you would guide uh, the words that we speak uh, as we go over the pitfalls and the, the things that we can do better. Help us uh, as families to fight for our marriage, fight for each other, and fight to be close to you. Uh, remove from us any doubts that we have. Remove from us any fear and any faithlessness. Thanks for this um, class and this group of people who want to get closer to you and uh, to strengthen their marriage. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> if you're taking notes um, and you'd like to turn to, you don't have to turn to the passage, but you want to make a, um, make a note on uh, Proverbs chapter 24 in verse 27. And I'm going to, I wrote down the amplified version. And it says, put first things first, prepare your work outside and get ready for yourself in the field. And afterward, build your house and establish your home. You know, God is telling us through the the writer in in this proverb that we need to make priorities. We need to have priorities. We need to put first things first in in, uh, perspective of what God wants. Right? Sometimes it's easy to, to look at a passage like this and say, well, I can see both sides of this. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's really important for our house to be nice, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, but, but then on the other hand, if we don't have any income from the fields, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to support that house. So it, 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 it really is something that we need to be intentional when it comes to priorities. Mm-hmm. And I think all of us would agree, because we're here at a marriage retreat, that our marriages are important, right? Right. Okay. That's why you took the time out of your, your life to come up here and to focus on your marriage. And we've already heard some great messages. I've been cut to the heart. I hope you have uh, about some things that you see that you need to change. But 
we need to make our marriages what God wants them to be, okay? Um, you know, um, the, uh, w when we set our priorities correctly in marriage, don't we see other things happen? Just like, um, just like Tom Brown was talking about, you can get in the zone. When, when your marriage is um, hitting on all cylinders, as they say, um, things move better in your uh, other areas of your life, in other relationships in the church, with the way you relate with your kids, right? You are, you are, um, uh, you are um, not as insecure in, in, at work or in other situations. So if we just set that priority and make, make the, our marriage what it needs to be, other things will happen that we will definitely appreciate. Um, we're going to kind of, the, the rest of the time is going to kind of broken down in the, in the following framework. We're going to talk about some pitfalls first that we've all experienced. Heard kind of a um, foreshadowing of, of that from Holly and, uh, and, and Matt. But we're going to talk about some things that we've experienced that really were hard for us. Hopefully it will help you to, to relate, but also to avoid some of those things if you have uh, the opportunity to do that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about investing and nurturing in our marriages. And then we'll kind of close out with some, um, some uh, uh, time for question and answer. Okay? So in regard to pitfalls, one of the most difficult areas, at least for me and for Rini and I in our marriage, was when we were in Philadelphia and the company that I worked for, I worked for a construction company, the company started to grow and growing geographically. And so people were starting to, to be asked to go on the road and, and uh, take projects that would take them out of town. So I, it, my, my first out of town assignment was down in, uh, in uh, 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 Greenville, uh, North Carolina. That's right. South, South Carolina? Greenville, that's right, Greenville, South Carolina. I'm and, not usually good at that. And uh, mm -hmm. so this was my schedule. I'd get up on Monday morning, I'd, I'd pack my bag on Sunday afternoon after church, get up Sunday morning, go to the airport, fly out of town, be away until Thursday evening, come back and try to re-engage with the family. Mm -hmm. yep. and, uh, and I did that for nine months, okay? And there were some good things about that, but there was a lot of downside to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, if any of you have had to, to, to travel for your, for your work, but it can be, you know, spiritually it can be a disaster. Um, it was very, very, it was difficult, but we kind of made do thinking, okay, we're do, putting one, uh, uh, doing one for the team, and then we figured someone else would get another, or someone else in the company would, you know, take their turn. <clears throat> well, um, so again, we made the best of it. Um, and it, it started to get a little harder the next time I was asked to do that. The next time I was asked, they sent me up to Connecticut. And so we were living in Philadelphia, and so I would jump in the car early in the morning, Monday morning, the same thing. Drive up to Connecticut, work all week, live in a hotel, eat at restaurants, mm -hmm. and then come back home and try to re-engage with the family. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, um, my son was a senior in, in high school, um, we had taken on the additional responsibility of, um, uh, of kind of a, we can call it a foster child, but uh, a, uh, another, another uh, young man on his swim team, his parents were moving back to Korea. And he had gotten involved in the swim team, he'd been doing really well and wanted to stay. So we said, well, you know, why doesn't he live with us for a year? Well, that was like two months into that, they sent me to Connecticut. So it put so much more strain on Rini and, and our home life um, to have another child that wasn't ours and then uh, there were more and more complications from that. Uh, so, you know, I would come home and uh, Rini was, you know, running uh, 300 miles an hour trying to keep all the, sp the plates spinning and um, I, she looked at me like I was on vacation. You know, I'm living in a hotel, eating out every night. And well, he was. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a little bit of conflict there, right? 
Um, you know, I, I tried to do the best I could to engage in, in the local ministry that was there, but it didn't quite work with, you know, my schedule being there. They, they, they had midweeks on Thursday night when I was traveling back. And, and so it, that was difficult. Um, but it, it really became a strain on, on our, our marriage. At that time, we also had committed to uh, facilitating um, marriage dynamics. Anybody done marriage <laughs> dynamics before? Okay. We had gotten that, that summer before we got trained in how to facilitate and we'd signed up to, to do uh, marriage dynamics. And we were doing the homework on the phone with each other. Now, you know how difficult it is to engage with some of that those hard questions you, you got to deal with and we were fighting on the phone and and uh, it was very a very trying time and uh, one of the things that I had determined through that whole process was I don't want to do this anymore okay and that's kind of one of the, the reasons that we're out here now is I said I'm gonna change jobs because I know that right. they're gonna continue to ask me sure. to do this yeah and it's going to be a challenge. And even, you know, in, um, you know, uh, it was really cut to the heart when, when I um, was listening to Tom Brown today because I, I could see my life on the road going that direction. Mm -hmm. I never was, you know, nothing ever happened immoral. Um, to tell you the truth, I made some bad decisions while I was out, drank too much, and, and you know, didn't, wasn't, uh, um, righteous in that way, but I could just see that pattern of making bad decisions while I was away. Not, you know, not, I'm sure that something would have happened down the road. Mm -hmm. So I, I thank God that I said, there's enough, I've got to make a change, I've got to do something differently. And uh, we, we were fortunately able to make a, a change of venue as well that I think was the best in, in God leading us. So. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, um, we, I think we've learned through that, that situation, and, uh, and, and I, I really want to um, I want to say that you, we need to really be aware. Satan is mm -hmm. after us. I, I think I want to just echo what, uh, um, what Tom had said. Um, Satan is after us. Sometimes we're just kind of lackadaisical mm -hmm. going right. through our spiritual lives and going through our Christian lives. And we, we, don't, we don't realize how uh, God is, or how Satan is really after us, and he's trying to trip us up every, every uh, avenue we go down. Mm -hmm. so. Amen. Um, thank you for that. I, I know brothers who are traveling and that, the struggles that they have, because it, it's hard to stay connected and re-engage. Um, one of the other pitfalls that we faced, I kind of like elaborated on it when we were first getting started, was financial. Um, and the scripture that I have to share that goes with it is in Proverbs 22, 7. And it says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is the servant to the lender. You know, and, um, you know, that was very true in our lives. When we first moved to Colorado from Florida, we were debt free. Um, had money in our pocket. Everything was good. So what did we do? We continued to live like we did in Florida when I was making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Well, you aren't making a lot of money anymore because you just moved into a new area and you're still spending like you were making a lot of money. We bought a home that was way over our heads uh, and we didn't have much income. Then came the downturn and the downturn was caught me off guard. So what did I think? Let me just spend more money in advertising and marketing to kind of work my way out of this hole. People weren't buying. I was spending more money than what I was bringing in and it was just, it was terrible. It became very stressful. I became a slave to my work. Um, you know, it, was, it wasn't uncommon for me to work 30, 40, 50 days straight without a day off. And I'm talking 10, 12 hour days, just trying to make it work on top of everything else. Every decision that we made at that time in our lives really was framed in how we were doing financially. Um, you know, but we just kept living like the money was gonna come. I'm the optimist. I'm the guy who's like, well, I've got these five sales coming and they're all gonna close in the next month. Now, reality is two of those are gonna fall off, you know, so I only really had three closings and 
you know, that has. The financial struggles in marriages, especially with the middle school and teen years, because they cost more than they did when they were an infant, you know? I mean, y'all are going, I heard that was the collective, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, the financial struggles become more of a focus than they need to be, and they can derail the priority of the actual marriage, so anyway. So um, I am just going to talk about um, one of the pitfalls, I think, or one of the hard things, and I'll talk louder, <laughs> is um, raising children with emotional and um, health issues. Um, because I think that we have a lot of children now who have a lot of emotional issues, and, um, and it's a hard one. Uh, Joel and I have three of our four children have some emotional issues. And, um, and, you know, when we were, when the kids were young, it was a lot harder, I think, to get help for um, the kids. And um, one of our children had them when he, he <laughs> when he was young, really young. And we didn't really know what to do, you know, with a lot of the stuff that he was going through. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, um, uh, no. I'm always like, yeah. um, I think sometimes these are the hardest challenges to go through yeah. because they're, I, I think as a parent, you know, we're just so protective of our kids mm -hmm. that you want to hover over them and you want to protect them and you want to make sure that everything's okay, that sometimes you don't let other people in. And then sometimes I think also you have, as a mom, I think what Don said earlier, you know, like the moms tend to do most of this stuff. So I think, you know, you have your little mama bear claws out and you're going to protect that child no matter what. And you're doing so much for the kids that sometimes you lose your perspective of what's really happening. And um, so I think with our son, you know, he was in third grade when everything kind of first started happening. And, um, you know, he, he it, it, you know, he has depression, and he had anxiety, and we didn't really have anything of that at the time in our family. So we were kind of like, hmm, you know, and we got him tested, and they were like, put him in a hospital. And we're like, excuse me, <laughs> you know, like, you're talking about our son? And then, you know, he wanted to commit suicide, and you're like, you know, so if we didn't hear him, I'd be like, you know, where is he? And is, you know, the door is closed, or the window's closed. And you would just start, like, kind of being, like, weird. You know, you would start not doing the right thing either and not trusting God. And so, anyway, I think that it, it's a huge thing, you know, when we have issues. Then we also had a daughter that when she was in high school, she was very, very um, active sports-wise. We had all kids who were in sports, and I coached swimming. My kids were swimmers, and um, and then she was playing lacrosse, and she was really good, and then her health started failing, and we didn't know what was going on. Doctors and doctors and doctors, as if we didn't do enough of that already. And then we couldn't figure out what was going on. Then they recommended us bringing her to the Mayo Clinic, so we brought her to the Mayo Clinic. And, you know, there still weren't a lot of great answers. So again, I think you're protective, and you're feeling like, you know, no one else in the church really knows what's going on or they don't know exactly how to help you. So I think that these challenges can be really, really hard because, you know, sometimes you just want to, like, pull in instead of reaching out to those that really can help. I don't think everybody can help, and I don't think that everybody did help. And I think everybody has a different perspective. So I think we have to be careful with some of that because everybody has opinions mm -hmm. and they all have an aunt or an uncle or a father or a sister or somebody who's had something and they all have great, you know, advice. Right. But I think you have to be wise with who you're going to get help with and make sure that somebody knows you. 
So I think that, you know, through this all, I don't think we did it perfectly either. And looking back, I'd have a lot more things that I would have done differently. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about, you know, the plans. But I think in, in our marriage, the things that were hurtful is that I don't think I communicated well with Joel. I think what ended up happening is that I was tired, you know, on top of the kids having their issues. I have fibromyalgia and I have chronic fatigue and I wasn't well either. So I was trying to run them around and I was like run down also. So I think that when he came home from work, I was like exhausted. And so to go through what the doctor said about this or this or this, I was like, I'll tell you tomorrow and then tomorrow had its own challenges and then right. the next day had its own challenges so I think it really hurt our communication and we were disconnected mm -hmm. and then I felt like he didn't care and he didn't read my mind and <laughs> you know so all of that you know those are pitfalls too when you have kids with health or you know emotional challenges pitfall that I'm going to cover is the busyness of the schedule. As I shared earlier, we had a busy schedule. The scripture I want to read for you is Proverbs 27, 12. The prudent see, see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. And I look at our life at that time, we were busy. We were going nonstop. We had our kids in so many things it was hard to say no. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids want to do more. They want to do this. They want to do that. And, you know, it kept adding up. And then you got on top of it, kids graduating. So you've got all that senior stuff and back to school nights and all that fun stuff. Um, so it all comes as a challenge and it all took its toll on our marriage because as we shared, our communication just became communicating what was going on that day. We'd ask how we were feeling, but what would come out was to do's. And I became the list person. I didn't even realize how much it was affecting me emotionally. I just, I have a hard time personally getting in touch with my emotions. I'm not a super emotional person. Most women are, but I'm not. So I have a hard time doing that. Matt's a lot better at it than I am. So it takes me a lot more to process things and think things through and figure out what am I actually feeling about this. So I didn't. We were too busy to do that. And it was okay because that's what was supposed to happen, right? We're in the busy time of our lives and we just kept checking things off and doing things. And we forgot how to communicate to each other. And it nearly destroyed our marriage during that time. Mm -hmm. And that scripture, I just, I implore you. I know a lot of mm -hmm. you are in that time of your life. Things are busy. Your kids are running you in different directions. You're not communicating. Um, it, it's a cycle, just like that scripture says, you know, you're just going to keep doing the same thing and you're going to suffer for it. Mm -hmm. You've got to take it seriously and you've got to get serious about it. Amen. So we're going to kind of move from the struggles into some of the solutions and the, the victories. Because the, the, though we all had these things that are, were going on, um, you know, we different, God worked in our lives to help us to overcome. So we're gonna go into some practicals and things like that, but I, I wanted to share, before we get into practicals, I wanna share a little bit about heart. <coughs> In Matthew 6, 19, it says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and, ro moth and rust destroy and where thieves break <clears throat> in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. If you just took everything that we're about to share about things to do to, 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 have a, to prioritize your marriage and did them, there would be some benefit. But if you did it with your heart, Amen. if you really put your treasure where your, where your marriage is and you really treasured that, mm -hmm then it will flourish. So the, to begin this section, we want to just really remi remind us, it starts with the heart, and that's, um, and we'll kind of go from there. You know, uh, Rini and I, I think we have a pretty good marriage. Yeah. Amen. 
it doesn't mean we don't have things to work work on. And and I I do appreciate coming to these marriage retreats because I, I I see areas in my life where I need to continue to work and take it higher. Um, you know, um, one of the things that um, I think that we have done over the years is taking special time to get away. Um, as a matter of fact, with coupled with this marriage retreat and our anniversary kind of falling all together, we came up here early on Wednesday night, so we've been kind of nice. spending a couple nights, to, nice. days and nights together. <laughs> so, um, so he's a happy man. So we're, we're both <laughs> on the happy side, which, you know, the, the, the grind of work and all the things that, you know, around the house, that you kind of get, get rid of that. But uh, one of the things that uh, has, has impressed upon me recently is how important, and even even Tom talked about it in, in the men's group, our words of building each other up makes so much of a difference, you know? Um, Rene and I recently started um, listening to the um, Gary Smalley uh, videos. Has anybody heard of Gary Smalley? Okay. And, you know, he, he's uh, done a lot of things on marriage and relationships. And, and one of the things that um, has made an impression on me recently with one of the, thing, one of the ones the sessions that we listened to, was <clears throat> how he came to a realization in his marriage that he wasn't uh, treating his wife with, with honor and respect. And he uses the example of, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's very visual because he's, he's got the video and the, the audio, and you can see, see it, and, and Rini and I listened to this one together. He brings out this violin, okay, and he says, you know, and, and some of the strings are broken and it needs to be restored and everything. And, and he shows it to people and he says, look inside and it says Stradivarius. Mm -hmm. And what's your, <laughs> somebody said it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's amazing. You know, that's amazing. It's probably worth a half a million dollars, this yeah. little violin that needs to be restored. And he showed people that passed it around. What if we had that, that, um, Response every time we saw our spouse. Amen. Whoa. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. You know, we can we can do that. Amen. We can change the way we think, and we and 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 it's it's just really made me think. Um, I need to change my thinking. Okay. God has blessed me with a woman. Uh, in, in Proverbs eighteen verse twenty two, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. Right. Any all of you here yeah. found a wife. Amen. Amen. Right? right? And yes. have received favor from the Lord. Right. Amen. Okay. Wow. We need to continue just to really look at our our, our our marriages that way. And and allow God and and God's the heart of God to really well up inside of us and see how much we've been blessed. Amen. So. Amen. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things, you know, if, if finances are an issue, you know, and, and it, it is, it's actually one of the other classes that people are at yeah. probably right now are the, are the finances because that will, that can affect how our, how we prioritize our marriage. You know, um, when we realized the house was killing us because we had a big payment on it, we sold the house. You know, that was one of the first steps within a year of the crisis that we were like, we're going to fix up this house and we're going to get rid of this and we're going to go into something cheaper. Um, I had a truck. I had a nice Toyota Tundra truck that was like two years old. I sold the truck. You know, it was like, I don't need that payment. And we bought used vehicles ever since. Um, we created a budget. We clipped coupons. Um, I mean, we did everything that financial peace. We didn't have financial peace at that time, um, but we did the things that they had told us to do. Um, we Holly went back to work. It wasn't a me problem. It was a us problem. You know, our finances weren't. Hey, Matt's going to solve everything. Matt's going to go in and, and do this. It was Matt and Holly are going to sit down have real discussions, make real plans to get out of this mess so can, we can really focus on what we need mm -hmm. to do. Um, nothing was off limits. 
um, the house that we bought afterwards. We had gone from a $2,800 a month payment to a rental that was $2,200 a month to a house that was $1,200. We bought a we bought a repo. It was just the first time Holly went into it. She's like, "I ain't buying this." You know, <laughs> that was her first response. And actually, we didn't. We went and looked at another home. This one came back on the market, and I'm like, "I think we can make this work." And we went in and we made it work, and we lived there for three years. Um, you know. We got creative on date nights. I mean, we could still go out. We could still Man. spend time together. You know, we would ship the kids off to, to, hey, you're staying at this kid's house. You're staying at this kid's house. You're going here. Hey, we've got the house to ourselves. You know, it was like, it was awesome. You know, we could find things to do creatively on a tight budget. But as we started to get out of debt. We would pay off a credit card, get out of one, get out of those payments, started to really chop things down. And then also it helped that the economy started to come back and my business started to go, it flipped. And it, there was this huge, huge, um, a, a lot less stress because we weren't strapped financially. Um, so that was some of the things that we did. Awesome. But if I could piggyback on that, a big thing was we started communicating about it. He wasn't just carrying it all on his shoulders. We started talking about it, and that was big. Yeah. And just, you know, as far as um, investing in our marriage, uh, uh, you know, with the kids, with the emotional and the health challenges, I think that, you know, the things we did well during that time is that we did have people in our lives, you know, some of what I talked about. but. I think that, you know, we got regular input from people. We, every Friday night for years and years and years, and even after everything with the church happened, we got with people every Friday night and we got discipling. And we had, they were our best friends, you know. I think, um, you know, what was talked about today with Tom, I, I think we need discipling. And, it, it doesn't matter what like I think that's why like you can have these mama bear claws with your kids but the truth was you know we needed help and you know we needed it more than the kids did because there was so much going on and we needed friendships I think you know you don't always need discipling sometimes you just need friends Amen. and I think that you know as disciples I think sometimes we get lost in that you know we don't really have a lot of good friends and I you know I think the benefit of that was that not only did we have friends we had their kids over you know and, and our kids had friends and then our children had two other sets of parents mm -hmm. so our children and these couples are still very close and actually you know our daughter who's here um, you know, who was living in Philadelphia, she was discipled by my best friend for a long time, you know, because that's who they were close to. They still talk. And, you know, one of my best friends here that I've gotten close to, she now gets with because she trusts them. And I think you have to have those kind of friendships that your children, middle school and high school, will one day be able to have, you know, friendships when they're older that will make a difference and will change their lives. Right. So I think, you know, investing in your marriage makes a difference in your children's marriage oh. or in your children's lives. I think the other thing that we did well is that we were faithful in prayer and in our Bible study. Amen. And I think, you know, that, you know, that there's a marriage takes three. A marriage, God never created marriage to just be husband and wife. You know, he created it to have a man and a woman in a growing relationship with each other and with God. Yeah. And when we're growing with God, then we'll be growing with each other. Yeah. And I think that, you know, again, if we don't have that, then it's not working. Okay. And there are so many people who really just don't even have time with God. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have time with God, your kids know it. Mm -hmm. So it, to invest in your marriage means investing in God you know investing in that time and I, I can tell you our children say to us still to this day that that is what they could always count on us having time with God every day 
And, you know, we got cards from our kids for our anniversary. And Amanda, who's the one in Philadelphia, wrote to us and told, told us how grateful she is for our marriage and how, how it gives her hope for a marriage one day. And I, I believe that that's what you want for your kids. And she knows where we stand, you know. But I also think, you know, the other thing that the health challenges did is, you know, we learned that not everything can be worked out, you know? Yeah. And we so want to fix things. You know, don't we always want to fix things? Yep. Mm -hmm. And we can't. Yep. You know, there, not everything can be fixed. But God, God can fix it. However it works out, God can fix it. We just might not see the answers in our little you know, sight line. Right. But God sees it, and we have to trust that. And I think that's what helped us, is that we would pray together. And we prayed together every day. And we still pray together every day. But I think that's the challenge for us, is that we had to hope and pray and trust God that even if we didn't see answers, that he was in control. And when our son became a Christian, he was 16, he said that the thing that helped him become a Christian was his mess of a life, you know? And that if he didn't have all of that in his life, then he wouldn't have become a Christian. And I think, you know, I would like pray, God, give it to me. You know, like I would rather my kids never have that. But I always understood the scripture in John 3.16 that said God so loved the world that he gave his son because you don't ever want your kids to have to right. go through that. But God did that for us. Right. Amen. And with us, with the busyness of schedule, um, I guess on the practical side, we had to make a decision. Like that scripture I shared, you know, you got to get serious. you got to get radical. We had to make a decision that we were destroying our marriage to keep our kids going, to keep everything going, keep all these balls bouncing. And it was destroying us. We weren't having time for us. And in the long run, is that helping our kids? Nope. It, isn't, it, it has had a profound effect. And I think, you know, one of our children has fallen away from God. Um, and our son is going through some difficult issues right now he's working on but um, it, it made a, it makes a difference um, not how many activities you have them in but how good of example you are what your marriage looks like to them mm -hmm. I mean we had them going in a million different directions we had them in everything when, when we finally realized what was happening we stopped we cut things way down we cut, cut him down to one activity. Josh got out of the travel hockey and was just on a, a high school team at that point. You know, and guess what? He wasn't going to be a superstar hockey player anyways. So it did he not. Thinks he, is. he thinks he is. <laughs> it didn't hurt him in the long run. Um, I think it did more benefit for them to see that we stopped and made our marriage a priority. So I think in the long run, that'll make the difference. Um, so, okay. okay, yeah, so um, at the time of our crisis, some of the things that we had to do was um, it really taught us to go back to God, much like what Rini was saying about prayer, reading your Bible, stuff like that. We were the, I, I, at least I was the guy that was, eh, I'll have a quiet time two, three times a week, you know, and I'm, I'm doing good, I'm kind of floating, I'm, I'm confessing, I'm getting with brothers. Once the crisis came and we realized where we were at, it was daily, and I, it was it was so much different. So I think the first thing that we've, you've got to do is take an honest assessment of your marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, and every marriage has good and bad. It's not when I say take an honest assessment is let's write down all the bad things. You know, no, that's not. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that. You have strengths. Mm -hmm. Every couple has strengths. So and spend that time really talking about, you know, honey, what do you see as our strengths? What do I see as our strengths? What do you see as our weakness? What do I see as our weakness? What, how, how what are those things? Um, the next thing that we, that happened, um, we sought advice and we sought input. Um, we got with elders, we got with couples. We were very open and vulnerable with everything that was going on. Nothing was off limits. 
very, very important because if you kind of hold things back, people are kind of, you know, it's kind of like going to the dentist where they kind of try to poke and see where the cavity's at. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, that hurts. Oh, all right, there's where the pain is. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do that with people spiritually. You have to be the one who tells them, mm -hmm. this is where it hurts. So you have to be willing to get help, you know. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, do you have people in your life that you trust that you can be truly vulnerable with? And we needed that. So, yeah. so we took an assessment. Uh, I, got, I went to counseling. In the counseling, the counselor had us do one thing, and I went to a, a men's group. And in this group, you had to, it was high accountability. Every, every week you would do a check-in, and it would ask, how many times did you do this thing called Thanos? Thanos meant you would share your feelings, you would affirm the other person, you would share what your needs are, and the O was um, you would own your stuff, the things that you did wrong. And, you, and so when we first started this, we talk about uncomfortable, I and mean, we're so used to communicating at the surface level of what's going on in our busyness, you know, how are you feeling today, you know? I didn't want to hear how she was feeling today. You know? <laughs> it took a lot for me to dig down and figure out what I was feeling. Yeah, Holly's it's not natural for me. Holly's not a natural sharing how she feels person. But we would we've learned share our feelings. We would affirm one another. I mean, who of us in here doesn't like to be told, "This is what I love about you. This is what you did well today." You know, when you made your coffee for me this morning, that made me feel really good. Awesome! I'm making it tomorrow. You know, you did a great job with those dishes. And now maybe not so much. All right. Um, but owning our own stuff. We had to do this daily. It was very uncomfortable early on. But as time would go on, because I knew I had to go in and say, well, I did it five out of seven days this, this week, it, we did it more and more. It became more natural. And eventually, I mean, in our mornings now, this is something that we do when we have our quiet times together. We don't do them together, but we read and, and that. And then we set our Bibles down and we just start talking. And yeah, there's some business stuff, but we finally, it's a safe place where we can share how we're really feeling, what's really going on. Well, what, what it, it was, and we connect. And, you know, so we went from, you know, her feeling very lonely, very abandoned, me feeling very detached with busyness as a wall to, I mean, I look forward to our mornings when we get to just talk. So. Um, what we're going to do right now is we're going to kind of transition into kind of a Q&A, but I really do appreciate you listening to us uh, share some of the things that um, we have done that have or <coughs> things that, that have helped us in our marriages to really nurture it, but also some of the pitfalls so that you can um, avoid some of those things if, if possible in your lives. But uh, um, thank you so much. Um, for coming to the class and, and we'll be praying for your uh, families and your kids and your th th this difficult time in your life because it can be very busy but you need to make it a priority so let's open it up I have questions question. so um, I lost my job last June <coughs> and it's harder of course without that income mm -hmm. but my daughter has some pretty extreme behavioral issues right now so I can't return to work so um, I guess, you know, and then of course, Don's reaction to some of the healthcare is, nope, don't take her again, you know, but it's really stressful. So how do we cope with all that going on at the same time? I mean, I, I mean other than praying and doing. Yeah. <clears throat> I think one of the first things that we would do, or that I would suggest, is you know, make him pray. But get other people who know you involved in your life and see what bounce it off them. What what would they do? What you know? Talk to an elder. Talk to ministry people, mm -hmm. um, and see what what solutions. Um, I know uh, one couple that we are really close with that you know they're going through some financial tr tr troubles. So. What she's had to do, because they needed insurance, she's now working at a, a Starbucks early in the morning. She goes in at like four and gets out at, at eight. Mm -hmm. She only works four hours, helps with the income, but the biggest sure. thing was the insurance. Mm -hmm. And then right. the husband kind of takes care of things 
until she gets home and in their jobs kind of work where they can do that but I think in every situation if you get advice and you and you seek there are ways that you can help one another and talk what each other would like to do I don't know I, I remember struggles like that in our family where um, you know Rini would get advice to go to a what I would call a witch doctor which wasn't covered by insurance. And that was really helpful to hear that too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, but, you know, and we had to, to, to get advice. We had to get, you know, what do we do? You know, how do we sort through the, how do we navigate through this time? Uh, I think that we, we, we need to be, as husbands, we need to be definitely compassionate to our kids, which, you know, sometimes is hard for us because, you know, all we can see is the financial side. And, uh, but I think that's where um, it, it really helps to have another couple in, in, your, in the church, in your lives, that they can help you see, you know, uh, the things that you don't see because you got blinders on. I think to, you know, make sure that you have a good assessment of where your child is to begin with, mm -hmm. you know, that you know what's really going on. Well, that's the hardest part, right now we don't. So, so. that would be my first suggestion is we'll maybe you know, we can talk about it, but I think yeah. you really need a good assessment first. Mm -hmm. And then that, if you have a good doctor and a good assessment, maybe a neurologist, and then they will give you the help. Okay. Um, so that would be my real suggestion is that you make sure that your daughter, it's daughter, you said, yeah. right, has the right help first, <clears throat> and then from a specialist, and then go from there. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you guys. Um, mm -hmm. This is very, um, you guys did a great job. Mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, thank you. It's very, very helpful. Uh, we have kids in middle school and high school. Um, and I think it's a, you know, it's a challenge when you say, you know, not everything can be worked out by us. Like that's a, that's a hard teaching to swallow. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, you know, like I know it, but to see the kids um, go through stuff and to surrender that this isn't gonna work out for us, you know, like we need God. And, and, and I appreciate that and I'm grateful for that. I think for me the question is, um, um, you know, when some of our kids are going through challenges, they wanna discuss it at the dinner table, you know, where everybody mm -hmm. is. But our kids are, we have, you know, kids ranging from 14 to eight. And, um, you know, when there's an emotional challenge and we want one kid to say, you know what, can we, <laughs> We need to discuss this separately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. um, like, how, what can we do as a couple to make sure that, you know, that that happens, like that that authority is respected? Because the tendency is that's where everybody gathers and, you know, nothing should be hidden from anybody anyway. Uh, but I think because of the ages of the younger ones, you know, sometimes our, our older kids bring up concerns that we're like, oh, okay, hold on, hold on. And, yeah. you know, things just kind of come out and like, just you know, put brakes on it. We can talk about this a different time, but you know, it still kind of comes up. And yeah. so, I guess for us, what can we do to really help facilitate those kind of discussions? Um, I think first of all, you guys being on the same page, whatever is, you know, do you guys talk ahead of time what works for your family so that you guys are unified, and then you can present that to them. Um, I think for our kids, our connection time, you know, making our marriage a priority also involved making our kids a, a, a priority. They're not separate, They're, they are involved. And so we would have, there were certain times when each kid could talk or felt like they would talk. And that was for us at prayer time at night. We would pray before we go to bed and that's when they would open up and we could talk about stuff like that. Our dinner table, <coughs> we would talk about something. It's but mostly joking think. around in fun time at dinner time. We kept it pretty light. Yeah. Um, but yeah. even just trying, as they get older, the older ones, to really <coughs> make sure you set aside a special night to take them out separately. You know, if you can have a little lunch or breakfast or fro-yo was Jessie's thing. That was when she'd open up still. If I take her for a her, yeah, I can find out anything that's going on in her life. <laughs> <laughs> Delete that from the thing. <laughs> that's what I would say too, because I think if you take them out individually, then you can have good times with them. I mean, we would 
you know, divide and conquer because I couldn't do, neither of us could do four right. a week, so we did two each a week. And, um, and it would be up on a calendar on our fridge so that they knew. They'd remind you. Yeah, right. it's my time. And some like, you know, Starbucks and some like this and some, you know, I'd go to Barnes and Noble with Cole and he would look at comic books, you know, and, but each person had their own thing. But I think during that time, you can say to them, I would really appreciate it if you wouldn't, you know, bring this stuff up at dinner because, you know, little one, you know, doesn't need to hear that. Right. So it would really be a big help and, you know, let's make dinner time encouraging and, you know, Sometimes things come up, and then you'll just say, "Hey, let's talk about this a little bit later." And you know, you know, right after dinner, we can talk about it. Yeah, you and don't make it a big deal. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. We we go, "Hey, you know, that's a good that's a good question. We want to talk, but we're kind of surprised by this right now. Maybe your dad and I can talk, and we can talk about it later and get back to you. You know, I think we. I always feel the pressure. Like I've got to an answer right now, and it has to be the right answer. You know, that's not real. I mean, how many of us could do that, right? I mean, you're going to have to be able to kind of regroup, think through it, and then have a plan to go rather than knee-jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. I, don't know. It, it just, I think in a lot that's helped in our personal communication is I need to let him know, I can't answer you right now. I'm going to answer you, but I need time to <coughs> process what you just told me. Yeah. 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 And, and just to, to give you a little hope, um, yes, it, there was a time where we despaired about what was going on very much and and just, uh, our son now is he's here at the at the retreat with his wife he's married um, he's got a degree in applied mathematics uh, a couple weeks ago he just passed his actuary exam so he is brilliant um, and God has worked things out yes he still struggles with certain things and and uh, uh, he's more self-aware than I ever was uh, but uh, um, uh, there's hope. And when I asked him if I could share, he's like, sure, no problem. I mean, he <laughs> shares about his life very openly and knows that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. God has worked in his life. Yeah. So, you know. Do you have a question? I do. Um, as far as, you know, you say you have to have people in your life and you have to be vulnerable and, you know, you have to get in there. Well, how do you balance that when, if you try to get with somebody or have to side one time with somebody and it doesn't work out and most of the time you pick I guess you pick the wrong person to be vulnerable with mm -hmm. and so then you end up getting hurt mm -hmm. and you feel totally you know you're trying but it's never enough or you're not good enough because we've both been through that so every time someone says oh well you should get up some discipline and you get some help with that we just go you okay, can't no thank you but no Got it. because you don't want to open yourself up and be vulnerable and then get yourself hurt again. Because mm -hmm. we used to have a disciple time with a couple and there were nights that he'd be so mad, he'd go vent to my aunt because we had to stop by her house or something. And he'd go down and vent to her because he couldn't take anymore. And I'd be in tears at home mm -hmm. because it was just overwhelming and it was horrible. And it doesn't make you want to, you know, you don't want to go, oh yeah, let me get with you guys. That's going to work out well. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and it would be better for my daughter, of course, you know, but she still sees what's going on. Mom, what are you crying about? Don't worry about it. Oh, well, is it this? Well, if I tell her no, then I've lied to her. Okay. You know, so she kind of knows what's going on. She's not, my daughter's a smart cookie, so to speak. But it's hard. To, how do you balance that to make things better for both your kids and yourselves? I mean, because if you can't find, you know, it's hard to trust it, I guess. What I'm asking is how do you? Do? I think. How does that work out? Well, I, I I get vulnerable with people who are vulnerable with me. You know, it's a two-way street. Um, I'm not. I I appreciate that because I've had we've had situations with couples where it didn't work out. So if that does if that is the case, then you pray and I, I think you get you try to find somebody that you do connect with. But it is a two-way street. You know. I'm much more open with somebody who's sharing with me their struggles mm -hmm. rather than the person who's got it all together and is coming to fix me. I mean, that's just not, you know, that's the way that it should be. It should be relational, you know. And, and I think even who you were saying that, that we need, sometimes we need just friend time, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's not just discipling and 
yeah, we have to get open, we have to assess where we're at, but we also need those times when we're just, you know, we're just hanging out, we're a little playing a game, or we're, we're going to go out to dinner. You, you know, it takes a little bit of both. And, and when you have several relationships, then you kind of get a feel for which one is, which one is this way, more of the friend, which one can we be more discipling, and I don't know. <coughs> I don't know. We, it's not always a natural fit. We've had good and bad relationships. Mm -hmm. so we've been disciples for 25 years. We can say every disciple <coughs> relationship we've been in has been great, okay. um, both on both ends. I've not been a good discipler to other people as well. So it, sometimes you're just not a good fit together. <coughs> I, I can meet the sister's needs. I just wasn't the right person in her life at that time. And there's been other people that have been in my life that just were not the right person in our life at that time. Maybe now they'd be fine, but right then when I knew <clears throat> this kind of person, they weren't that. So sometimes you just got to kind of, I like you said, mm -hmm. you got to be vulnerable and go out there. Mm -hmm. you got to take the chance. Right. Do what's right. And I think you yeah, have to sorry. keep trying sometimes. Uh -huh. You yep. know, yeah. like you some relationships are hard. and. I think some of my best, you know, friendships and some of the best mm -hmm. relationships are things I've had to fight for. Right. And I think they're not always easy, <clears throat> and they're not always the most um, natural. Some are. Like some people mm -hmm. I've met, and you're just a natural friend. But you know, when I was talking about friendships earlier, I've talked to a lot of people. Like we are in the Colorado Springs Church. Um, but I've talked to a lot of people, and friendships are such a hard thing. I mean, I don't know about men, but if you ask probably most of the women here, how are your friendships? You know, one to ten? I mean, like half of the women are shaking their head already. You know, why? Because it's hard. It takes hard work. There's a um, podcast from Timothy Keller on friendships, and all of you should listen to it. It's an amazing podcast and he talks about the whole thing of friendships they're hard because they take such investment mm -hmm. and a lot of us want this amazing friendship but in reality we aren't willing to put the investment in mm -hmm. that we want from other people and we're mad at other people I'm not saying that this is what you're doing but I think you know when I I, I do it like, I want a really great friendships, but like, you know, we have to like die to ourselves just like for our husbands, <laughs> you know, you really have to it's go after it and it's stinking hard. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in any discipling relationship, like it takes work mm -hmm. and it takes like giving yourself and it takes like <clears throat> calling and, you know, like finding out how they are and then like if they're not doing good, you have to call again and <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. you have to invest. And it's hard. So if, you know, I don't know, it's just hard. So I'm sorry for you because I think, you know, there's a lot of us that feel that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but if you if you really want it, God will provide. I believe that. Amen. Amen. So pray. Pray. Yes. That's what I was just going to say is, um, and I'm reminding myself this, just to spend some time in prayer. For God to put the right people in here. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Dawn? Well, I just, I love you guys. And uh, I remember the very first time that I ever even heard of the Seabalds was in a letter that Rob wrote to me. I don't even think we were dating. And, uh, <laughs> he just talked about your marriage and your family. And that was, I don't know, 23 years ago or something. And we've seen what they're talking about. And with the cooch arts as well. I mean, we when we moved to the southeast, they were selling their home and selling the truck and selling <laughs> this and that. And so we, I'm so grateful just to hear your hearts today, to hear your lesson, to hear your convictions. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we just respect you guys a ton. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing you. and what an honor it is to be able mm -hmm. to have seen and continue to see you with these. Um, Convictions and hardships, and just your relationship with God, just what overcomers you are. And great, great marriages. We're super grateful to have this experience. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. Don studied with our oldest daughter. Oh. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so we're very grateful yep. for her Amen. too.
All right. Um, thank you so much mm -hmm. for your attention, and uh, let's make our marriages a priority.